Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Canada's Magnitsky Law, Justice for Victims of Human Rights Abuses. The webinar will begin at 12 noon. Hello, and welcome to the webinar, Canada's Magnitsky Law, Justice for Victims of Human Rights Abuses. The webinar will begin at 12 noon. The chat feature is on until the webinar begins at 12 noon. To participate in the chat, please select in the chat box to all panelists and attendees, so all attendees can see your comments. So let's, get to try, let's try to get to know each other using the chat feature. If you like, Type in the chat box the program you took at the U of A, the year you graduated, and where you are watching from today. So if you like, you can put in the chat box the program you graduated from, the year you graduated, and where you are watching the webinar today. And hello to the human ecology graduate from 2004 in Edmonton. On our team, welcome. Hello everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Canada's Magnitsky Law, Justice for Victims of Human Rights Abuses. The webinar will begin at 12 noon. The chat feature is on until the webinar begins at 12 noon. To participate in the chat, select in the chat box to all panelists and attendees so all attendees can see your comments. And if you like, let's get to know each other in the chat. You can type the, uh, the program that you graduated from, the year you graduated, and where you are watching from today. Oh, welcome to our Alumna from Library Studies and a BA in English and Arts grad. Welcome, Sheila. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, now we're going to have some fun testing your knowledge of the Faculty of Arts with some trivia. So we're going to launch some polls pop up on your screen there. So in 1908, the University Senate established its first faculty named Faculty of English Studies, Faculty of History and Modern Languages, Faculty of Arts and Sciences, or the Faculty of Arts. And we've got lots of different answers here. Let's give you another minute. Okay, and the answer is actually the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. The Faculty of Arts and Sciences was established in 1908 with four departments, English, History, Modern Languages, and Applied Sciences. Okay, and our next trivia question is something current about the Faculty of Arts. How many departments are there currently in the Faculty of Arts? Is it 11 departments, 15, 20 or 45? Oh, it's great. This is another good question. We've got answers all across the board here. So is it 11, 15, 20 or 45 departments currently in the Faculty of Arts? Okay, and the answer is there are 15 departments in the Faculty of Arts. There are 11 centers and institutes, including the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, 20 honors programs and more than 45 graduate programs. Our next trivia question is about a famous arts alumnus. Todd Chernosky, 93 BFA, is a production designer and art director that has worked on the following film or films. Jurassic World, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, Star Wars, The Last Jedi, Avatar, Pet Cemetery, or all of the above.
And the answer is all of the above. He is known for his early implementation of digital, digital tools for design and effects within the film industry. He recently in 2020 finished work on the TV series, Star Trek Picard. So we're very proud of this alumnus. And our next question, also about a U of A alumnus, a former, a former editor of the Gateway U Alberta student newsletter or newspaper, and later a lecturer at the U of A, this arts alumnus became Canada's 16th prime minister, the youngest and the first native Westerner to hold that office. Is it John Turner, Joe Clark, Kim Campbell, or John Diefenbaker? The youngest and first native Westerner to hold that office. And the answer is Joe Clark. He earned a BA in 1960 and an MA in political science in 1973 from the University of Alberta. He was prime minister from June 1979 to March 1980. He was born in High River and took office one day before his 40th birthday. And just for reference, Justin Trudeau was 44 when he was elected in 2015. Then our final trivia question here. Arts alumnus Lauren Cardinal is a stage, tele television, and film actor, best known for portraying Sergeant Davis Quinton on Corner Gas. What degree from the Faculty of Arts did he earn? Was it a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Art and Design, a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting, or a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science? What degree from arts does our famous alumnus have? Oh, and again, the answers are pretty spread out, but the correct answer is actually Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting. Lauren Cardinal earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting in 1993, and he was one of the first Indigenous students to graduate with this degree at the U of A. Okay, and that concludes our trivia. Welcome everyone to the webinar, Canada's Magnitsky Law, Justice for Victims of Human Rights Abuses. The webinar will begin at 12 noon. The chat feature is on until the webinar begins at 12 noon. To participate in the chat, please select in the chat box to all panelists and attendees. And I'd like to welcome attendees. We had registrants from across Canada, the USA and the United Kingdom. And we also have guests registered from Peru, Russia, Ukraine, Switzerland, Denmark, Belgium, China, Germany, and Singapore. So a big welcome to those alumni joining us today from all around the world. And the chat is now closed for the session. But if you have questions for the staff or the presenter, please enter them into the Q&A section at the top or the bottom of your screen. And now we are at 12 noon, so we are going to get started. Hello, and welcome to the 54th annual Shevchenko Lecture, Canada's Magnitsky Law, Justice for Victims of Human Rights Abuses, with the Honorable Raynel Andrzejczak. The Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies is proud to present this lecture in partnership with the Ukrainian Canadian Professional Business Association of Edmonton. My name is Jody Richter. I work in the Office of Alumni Relations and I'll be your host today. The University of Alberta Alumni Association is a proud, global, supportive network of graduates collectively making extraordinary contributions to the alumni community, the university, and the public good. Part of our mission is to connect, engage, and support alumni by providing lifelong learning opportunities for personal and professional growth. The presentation today is about 30 minutes in length, followed by a question period ending at 1.15 p.m. We will be collecting questions throughout the presentation. Please type your question into the Q&A box, which will appear at the top or bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentation, 
these questions will be shared with the presenter to address. When the presenter appears on the screen, you can move the video of her by clicking and dragging to another corner of your screen. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Steve Patton, Interim Dean of the Faculty of Arts. Welcome. Thank you, Jody, and welcome to everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging that the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory. I know that many of our viewers are not here on Treaty 6 territory. I'm on, I'm on Treaty 7 territory today, but uh, in acknowledging uh, the Indigenous territories on which the University of Alberta exists, we are respecting the histories, the languages, and the cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. In welcoming you, I want to bring greetings from the Faculty of Arts. It's an interesting and challenging time in which we live with the COVID pandemic, working remotely, teaching remotely, striving to engage in our research remotely, but we are committed to supporting our students, to strengthening our undergraduate and graduate programs, and excelling in teaching and research agendas that make a difference for the public good. CIUS is an important part of the Faculty of Arts. It is one of our leading research institutes. The programs and activities that it delivers are widely supported by the community. A perfect example is this lecture, which I understand is now in its fifth decade, an impressive track record. The diverse research activities of CIUS has made the Institute one of the world's leading scholarly venues in the field of Ukrainian studies. Recently, CIUS has welcomed a new director, Natalia Kinenko Friesen, and under her leadership, CIUS is now exploring opportunities to enhance and expand its research agendas, to welcome in new scholars, and to address important issues, and to continue doing this even with the challenges of the COVID academic. I would now like to introduce Yars Balin. Yars, as many of you will know, is the former director of CIUS and the current and ongoing director of the cool Ukrainian Canadian Studies Center at CIUS. Yars will introduce our guest speaker for the day. Over to you, Yars. Thank you, Steve. I would first like to welcome everyone to the special COVID edition of the 54th annual Tarashev Chanko Lecture, which was inaugurated and hosted by the Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Association of Edmonton, and for four decades now has been co-sponsored by the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta. Our distinguished presenter today is Raynell Andrejchuk, a native of Saskatoon. She graduated from the University of Saskatchewan with a BA in 1966, and a law degree in 1967, after which she began her legal practice in Moose Jaw, that's in Saskatchewan, not Medicine Hat, which is in Alberta. In 1976, she was appointed a judge of the Saskatchewan Provincial Court after having initiated Regina's first family court. She also served from 1977 to 1983 as chancellor of the University of Regina and was chair of the Saskatchewan Institute of Public Policy a policy research institute created in 2000 by the University of Regina, the University of Saskatchewan, and the First Nations University of Canada. In 1985, Andrejcik was appointed Associate Deputy Minister of Social Services for the province of Alberta, of the province of Saskatchewan. Two years later, she was named Canada's High Commissioner to Kenya and Uganda, an ambassador to Somalia and Comoros before becoming ambassador to Portugal in 1990. She was also named that same year as Canada's permanent representative to the United Nations Environmental Program and the United Nations Human Settlements Program. From 1988 to 1993, she was Canada's permanent representative from the United, uh, to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. In 1993, she was named to the Senate by Governor General Ray Hnatishan on the advice of Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Andrejcik sat in the Senate chamber as a progressive conservative until 2004, when she joined the Conservative Party of Canada. Among her many achievements, she was active in the upper house, urging recognition of the Ukrainian famine of 1932-33 as a genocide. 
In May 2008, she was awarded the Order of Yaroslav the Wise for her substantial contribution to the development of Ukrainian-Canadian relations. Andrzejczyk also has the honor, a curious honor, of being one of 13 Canadians banned from traveling to Russia under retaliatory sanctions imposed by Russian President Vladimir Putin in March 2014. Having been appointed to the Senate in 1993, she was, she was following the retirement of Anne Cools on August 12, 2018, the longest serving member of the Senate until her own retirement on 14 August, 2019. With that, I am pleased to turn the microphone and the camera over to Raynell Andrejczyk, who will address the especially and regrettably timely and perhaps timely subject of Canada's Magnitsky Law, Justice for Victims of Human Rights Abuses. Raynell. Hi, everyone. Just while we're getting Raynell connected, just a reminder that you can submit questions at any point during the webinar. Just click in the Q&A box at any time to address the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I understand I was cut off there on the video, but uh, I hope that doesn't delay us. Thank you, Yars, for the introduction and thank you, Dean Patton, for your words. I certainly, uh, Dean Patton, associate with your uh, opening comments and in uh, light of brevity, I will not uh, uh, reiterate them. Uh, I'm very thankful to the University of Alberta, to the Faculty of Arts, the Alumni Association, CIUS, and also the Canadian Ukrainian Business and Professional Association in Edmonton. Um, it is wonderful to be part of collaborations, and therefore I uh, am especially proud to be part of the Shevchenko Lecture. It was supposed to be in March, but uh, COVID intervened. And uh, now we are at uh, a new way of communicating, and I hope that I can work out the technologies. Um, the Shevchenko Lecture to me is very special. One cannot grow up with the Ukrainian heritage and not uh, be influenced by Taras Shevchenko. Uh, if you work in the field of human rights, his writings lead you to believe the worth of every human being, the dignity of every human being, and that freedom, justice are in our souls. So it is not just a unique Ukrainian experience, it is an international experience. What I'd like to do today is, um, having had the privilege of sitting in the Senate and being in a position that I could in fact initiate and bring forward legislation, I think was a, an achievement of our democracy and an achievement of how our parliament functions. Many people work on human rights issues from their own perspective, and each one is valuable. And therefore, all of us have a responsibility and obligation to work on these issues. But being a parliamentarian gives you an additional responsibility, but many more opportunities. So I'm not going to thank all the people that helped me in this legislation. Those who thought of the idea first, those who tried to introduce legislation, those who did introduce legislation, and it did not proceed to full fruition. But all those people, and all those people that I worked with at the United Nations Human Rights Commission, and all my postings abroad, and just my own personal, have led me to really focus on human rights and how each and every one of us has a, a contribution to make. Um, today we're going to discuss just one area, and that's the Magnitsky Bill. I want it to be a conversation rather than a lecture or an academic uh, uh, treatise, if I could call it that. Um, I would have at the lecture done more, but uh, perhaps I will publish those notes later. 
Uh, what I really want to do today is to tell you how important the Magnitsky bill is, but it is one of many initiatives that Canada and the world need to take to bring more justice to those, in many cases, who cannot defend themselves or, in fact, to support those who are. The Magnitsky Bill, uh, and it was Bill S-226 when I introduced it, was named the Justice for Victims of Corporate a Corrupt Foreign Officials Act, known as the Sergei Magnitsky Bill. Uh, the title there tells you why Magnitsky. Magnitsky was a lawyer. He was hired by Bill Browder and the Her uh, Hermitage, um, Heritage Fund uh, to actually work at some corruptive um, measures that were taken against a financial company. He unearthed illegal activity, improper activity, or unjust activity. Nonetheless, he worked at it, he did not shy away from it, and he lost his life because of it. Sergei Magnitsky is one of many in many countries who stand up to corruption, who stand up to gross violations of human rights and pay the ultimate price. So it is fitting that the bill was named after Sergei Magnitsky as much focus at that time was on the activities that led to Sergei Magnitsky losing his life in Russia. Um, if one wants the details, one should read Red Notice, written by Bill Browder, that will give you the understanding of how complex and how intricate and how international these transactions are that lead to the violations that led to the Magnitsky Bill. In summary, the bill is to provide for the taking of restrictive measures in respect of foreign nationals responsible for gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. In the bill, two principles are there. It is to attack abuses against international human rights and also corruptive practices that in fact rob the citizens of any particular country, the resources that are so scarce to make their lives lived with dignity. It proposes to amend the Special Economic Measures Act and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. In other words, we are exercising Canadian jurisdiction, Canadian responsibility to uh, go after those violators who have either perpetrated gross human rights or have uh, dealt with corruptive practices. And both are embedded in the bill. But I should say, uh, and before I get into more detail on the bill, that there are all kinds of sanctions in the world. And part of what has happened since the passing of the Magnitsky Bill is some misunderstanding of the scope of the Magnitsky Bill and the motive for putting the bill in place. Um, we started with many sanctions in the trade field. We've had sanctions internationally in the um, international uh, uh, arenas, both the United Nations and with other um, regional groupings. They are there generally state to state or collectively taking action against perpetrators who may be states or who may be individuals or corporations. Uh, a certain amount of activity, of course, occurred after 9-11, and that was done uh, internationally, which led then to changing of local laws, Canada included. The Magnitsky Bill uh, and the motive that led me to get involved with it is that Canada has led for many decades on the international stage. For decades, Canada and its citizens individually and collectively in various ways and forms have tried to strengthen human rights, both locally and internationally. And it is a work in progress. 
Canada was instrumental in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the subsequent conventions, protocols, and agreements, and today continues to work uh, throughout those networks of international human rights instruments. I was fortunate in the Senate to be able to create, with my colleagues, a human rights committee. And what we did in a study which was entitled and tabled in 2001 in the Senate, entitled Promises to Keep Implementing Canada's Human Rights Obligations. What the committee found at that time was that there were many instruments that Canada cooperated with, signed on to, but implementation fully in Canada was not carried out for many reasons. But many of the reasons are this, uh, were the same reasons that other countries struggled to take an international treaty and put it into the law. We have a federal system. We have to consult uh, broadly. So we looked at the strengths and weaknesses of the systems and gave recommendations of how Canada could strengthen its internal uh, local laws. I would suggest that um, the full report might be of benefit to some of you uh, listening in. It really involves the machinery of implementing human uh, rights. In other words, how do we take the words that we put down in writing internationally into action within our own countries. Therefore, it led me to the Magnitsky Bill, which was certainly one bill that showed that we have to be sure that we are doing the best we can within Canada to ensure that justice, rule of law, and human rights is adhered to. What we found was that while we talk about strengthening human rights abroad, and while we uh, note the shortcomings of states abroad and individuals, we did not take action when the world changed. So legislation cannot be static. Our policies cannot be static. We must continue to update in a democracy to meet the expectations of our own citizens, but to meet the expectations of a changing world. And as we sit in COVID, we know how it changes us and how uniquely we have to learn and quickly to adapt. So what we looked at, uh, those of us who were looking at reiterations of the Magnitsky Bill, and that was originally started to target the uh, financial activity and the methods used by oligarchs and others to uh, actually have personal gain from state coffers. The issue became for me, what were the gaps in Canadian law? And what I learned from uh, talking to many people, having people approach me throughout the human rights uh, field, is that we're now a mobile world. We now have cyberspace, and these are the tools that perpetrators can use. Um, I think um, Mr. Karim uh, Mirza told it best in our committee in the Senate when he said, under a previous period in Canada's uh, existence as, and others, um, we talked about others' ab abuses within other countries, but the uh, gaining of wealth, etc., usually stayed in and around those countries. Now, those resources are being taken in a very mobile world, in a very complex world, with very unique procedures, often very multi, uh, multiplied in uh, various ways through various countries, to put resources in our country. Money laundering is the biggest one we can talk about. But also uh, coming to our country and availing themselves of, of the benefits of being part of a Canadian fabric. Not as uh, residents and not as citizens, but simply as uh, comers into our country. So 
what we wanted to do is to ensure that we are not enablers, that we are not aiders and abettors for those who have abused grossly the human rights of others in other countries or are going to avail themselves of coming on our soil. So the Magnitsky Bill is really attacking those two things. But in the process of the bill, it does other things. It, it does not dictate foreign policy, but it, is, it empowers the government to utilize this mechanism in assessing the foreign policy and using it as an educative tool, an informing tool, but also as a mechanism that would ensure that people realize that we intend to use it where necessary. Parliament had a role, and that of course is the bill. We can set out broad principles as we understand the will of the people in Canada. And in the study we did in the Senate, everyone told us that if we sign international treaties, we want Canadians to abide by them and we want our government to enact them to the extent necessary within our laws. So this is an enactment of what I think are international human rights principles into our law. I may be going over time here, but uh, uh, I, I just want to touch a few issues. The concern has been that implementation is as important as the in original uh, issues. And so if I were going to give advice to uh, this government and any other uh, government in Canada, it should improve, as has been stated often, the visibility of the mechanisms and the process by which the government comes to a conclusion to sanction a particular individual or series of individuals. It should maximize the use of these mechanisms in concert where necessary with other governments. It should not rely on the Magnitsky Bill as a fallback position when in fact they do not see any other mechanisms that can be used or for other foreign policy principles, they don't choose to use them. Magnitsky should stand on its strength as a necessary and uh, fully disclosed sanction procedure and process. To start, the government should look at its foreign policy in each and every country that it chooses to associate with. And it should look at the human rights aspects as part of that human rights policy. And it should look at the Magnitsky Bill and what it offers as a solution, not only at a crisis point, but in on its ongoing activity with any other country. Citizens in Canada need to be informed about the Magnitsky Bill about the process and how they can contribute. It means that we need to do a better job of understanding how complex uh, sanctions processes are and reach to our citizens to get their support, but also reach to our citizens to get information. We have a very diverse population with great interests, with great knowledge, and they can be part of the solution and must be. I want to also talk about the fact that uh, the Magnitsky Bill is probably one of the most interesting tools putting together international law and national law. And we need to do a better job of ensuring that what we say and expect of others in other countries is what we're doing at home. I recall uh, when I was on the United Nations Human Rights Commission and um, we would be uh, pointing out many of the abuses around the world, horrific abuses around the world. The pushback 
from many of the governments would be, well, what about your own abuses? What about your own situation in Canada? The response at that time was, because the Human Rights Commission was still in its uh, earlier stages, um, would be that we actually at one point had more complaints against Canada than any other country, proving that we were open to criticism, proving that we were attempting to deal with our crises in a very open and uh, forthright manner. But nowadays, we see that the international standards that we reach for, built for, are in question. And these standards now, we need to work on. We need to justify them as they are part of us and as what we believe to be an international standard. So our laws do need constant updating. They're the meeting and needs of people coming together changes very dramatically, sometimes very quickly. We need to be nimble and ready to address the issues and the procedures when they come forward. We need not to be enablers by our silence, and we need not to be shy about naming and in fact ensuring that we are part of the process that supports human rights activists and citizens. Magnitsky Bill has a great, great opportunity to join forces with those individuals in countries where there are no Magnitsky laws, where the laws are not properly enforced to say that we are working for your rights as much as ours. I think the Shevchenko lecture has always given me and CIUS has given me an opportunity to work on broad issues and has given me an environment where I was able, working with CIS, to work on many of the issues in Ukraine. Little did I know in the early 90s into the early 2000s that we would be talking about uh, territorial sovereignty and integrity of a nation as we are today about Ukraine, as we are looking to all of what issues we have to deal with in human rights. And I wish I had more time to talk about those. And something that I've said will generate a conversation. Back to you, Yars. Thank you, Renell. Uh, we are getting some questions, which I will um, relay uh, to you momentarily. But uh, I want to take uh, advantage of my prerogative as the uh, moderator to, to pose a couple of questions to get things going as well. Uh, first of all, a practical question. What is the procedure for getting someone targeted for sanctioning? Is it the kind of thing that a citizen of Canada can write and nominate somebody that they think should be sanctioned? Is it from our diplomatic corps that re re reply back and say, you know, we have strong evidence that this person is responsible for this, this, that? Uh, how do how does somebody get sanctioned? Um, good question. Uh, that is one of the issues that I think still needs to be uh, addressed, as I said, through information and through the government uh, indicating what their full process is to engage citizens. Uh, in the bill, it gave a lot of discretion for the government to set up the process. And partly was that we understand that foreign policy is an executive issue within our uh, democratic system. But the citizens are part of this uh, democracy, so is parliament. So any lever is available which ones does the government listen to is the issue. Is there a way that the government wishes us to respond? Uh, we've seen on issues of China, of Burma, Myanmar, uh, of uh, the Uyghur issue, of Syria, etc. Citizens are well aware of the injustices. They're very plugged in. What we need to do 
is connect them with the mechanisms that exist. And that I think is role for the government to explain how would wish to engage. But it, I, personally, I think we have a very competent Canadian um, uh, population that knows how to get to our government. So I see it through editorials, I see it through direct engagement, I see the opposition playing its role in Parliament. Uh, all of these uh, ways are that we should not restrict ourselves to a more legalistic format where they must apply or send in a letter, etc. We should leave all open uh, avenues. But I think the government needs to um, be more transparent and more visible of how they're utilizing this mechanism. There are choices to be made. They are choices that the government makes, but citizens have a right to know. I don't know if that answers it. Okay, I have a question that I'll relay from um, uh, C.H. William Chung. What is the most significant provision in the bill? Um, that's a hard question. I, I think the, there are a number of significant uh, provisions. The first is that we are acting to sanction those that have committed gross violations of human rights. That's one section. The other is for corrupt activity. And that goes to all of these things like money laundering, uh, of uh, misusing systems and resources. And uh, if you look at how money is transferred and how it's dealt with now, it transfers around the world many times. And um, so therefore, I think the corruptive activity and the gross human rights violations are extremely, extremely important. Um, so I think that's a, a very, very strong signal and, and uh, sections of the bill that are very, very important. What is also important is that we didn't create another mechanism. What we did, in the bill uh, through Parliament is attached to what is called SEMA, which is the, uh, the uh, Economic Measures Act, and attached to the Refugee and Immigration Act, sections to cover the gross violations and the uh, corruption, because there were already sanctioned provisions in those. So we're not making the bill stand alone, and we're not making the bill uh, another bureau bureaucratic process. Who is, uh, okay. how many, can you tell us how many individuals have been sanctioned uh, since our, the adoption of the Magnitsky law and which particular countries have been uh, affected by sanctions, Canadian sanctions? Oh dear, <laughs> I knew you'd ask me that question. It changes. Um, there were sanctions against Russia, uh, Russian individuals. There are sanctions against uh, uh, some in uh, China. Originally, South Sudan and Russia. Then we moved on to other countries. So I certainly could, in a written form later, provide the numbers. I know uh, recently there have been a number in Belarus. And as of uh, today, I received a notice saying there are further persons. It is a transparent list. You can go on the government website to find it, and maybe we can uh, have the connection uh, for that later. So it is starting to be used. My concern, as I say, is that we should be ahead of the curve. We have to look at the activities long before they become a crisis in the, the Uyghur issue is a crisis. We've known about it. There have been reports. Ambassador Ray has written about it and continues to be, I think, the spokesman for the government on that. Uh, we need to utilize these mechanisms earlier, more of a preventative nature, if possible, uh, or to thwart other activity, um, not just wait until a crisis point. I have a question here from uh, Elizabeth England. You highlighted the role of the federal government in carrying out our legal ob obligations through its foreign policy and federal legislation. 
but I understand that there is a significant provincial aspect to this matter. What efforts are being made to bring provincial legislation, especially in the area of corporate law, into compliance with our obligations? What other areas of provincial jurisdiction must be addressed? Well, I think there's a lot of property and civil rights in the uh, uh, provincial domain. And I think the uh, federal government, and to my knowledge, is that there are committees working between the province and the federal government on international issues and particularly in human rights. What I found in the past is that there were committees, but sometimes they weren't meeting in the way uh, regularly uh, as they should. So I would encourage that uh, uh, those committees continue working. Um, I think though it is Magnitsky takes what we have in Canada to another step. So uh, Magnitsky does not preclude, nor does it answer all the issues of real estate transactions, of money laundering, of casino activity, of uh, drug enforcement, etc. We know in our criminal, there is an aspect even of criminal law in those issues. And that's why it has to be a multi-pronged issue. Human rights is a very complex field and it is a changing field. So uh, I thank the uh, person, I've forgotten the name, uh, for bringing it forward because there certainly is a provincial role and a municipal role. Talking about changes, um, are there provisions for monitoring and adapting sanctions to deal with the ways that people are circumventing them? Uh, I've heard of, you know that uh, sometimes somebody who's been sanctioned, uh, suddenly the company is registered in a spouse's name or a family member's names to, so that they can get access to their cash or continue to do business. Uh, people are very good at this. And, and to be honest with you, I think that there are Western businesses that are complicit uh, in this and helping them uh, by doing business through these channels, these back channels. Can you comment about that? Well, that's what I was uh, intending to say that, um, the Magnitsky bills trap in time those that they could justify. And uh, there is a mechanism in the bill for those who think they're unjustly targeted to uh, go through a process to get delisted if their circumstance change or they shouldn't have been on. But the dilemma always comes is uh, if it is, uh, activity that they've either hidden or that they are so clever at moving here and there. Uh, do we have the resources to track and monitor? I know that some of my colleagues are looking at about tax evasion as one, uh, real estate, uh, corporate numbered companies moving them around. It is a very complex, difficult field. So I'm not under any illusion that we can trap and monitor everything. But this is why I think the government should have some mechanisms for follow-up. And But we are limited, I think, in resources and limited in knowledge because uh, as I found out doing criminal law, every time you plug a loophole, another one comes forward. And so it is vigilance that we're going to have to have. And that's where a role that citizens and parliamentarians can play uh, and we probably need to look again at our uh, laws. And those are, uh, I think there are some excellent reports coming out of some of the provinces because it, I'm using the classification of money laundering as in uh, covering many issues and aspects of that. Uh, we did put in some other legislation and um, uh, on uh, how money transfers uh, occur, et cetera. And so uh, uh, we need to strengthen other legislation. So that goes back to my first point is Magnitsky is one piece of what should be a fabric of human rights legislation and we must constantly update it. How many uh, other countries have adopted uh, similar legislation to the, our Magnitsky law? Again, it's a growing number. Um, Australia is looking at it. Um, we know that Estonia was one of the first. 
Britain has the bill. United States had up targeted Magnitsky slash Russia. It has now got a global human rights uh, Magnitsky bill. Um, the EU is struggling with it. Um, and certainly the EU Parliament has been instrumental in calling for a Magnitsky bill. Uh, and this is another role that Canada could play. When we started out on, on uh, after the Second World War on the uh, United Nations and uh, the Declaration, uh, Canada was one of the leaders in encouraging other countries, working with them to bring forward legislation. So I would like to see Canada quietly and vocally work towards encouraging other countries to bring the Magnitsky Bill forward. Um, and we have 193 countries in the United Nations. Right now, uh, we are not doing well in the Human Rights Council. And uh, there are many countries questioning these standards of human rights. Canada uh, should not take a role that is accusatory in any way, but a facilitating role to not say that we're doing better, but to say why adopting these standards like Magnitsky, like the uh, UN Charter are helpful in a country that, it, that is in such a vulnerable world. And I think COVID has done more than anything to tell us how close we are to each other and how uh, actions within one country impact on another. And so we need to strengthen our international dialogue, not monologue, but dialogue. That leads to a question asked by Nick uh, Jensen, or Neil Jensen, uh, what international collaboration is there in this area? So are, are states collaborating on, is this an ongoing discussion between states? I think that there are citizens uh, that are leading and uh, human rights activists in Canada that are bringing forward the Magnitsky Bill. Uh, it is perhaps not coordinated as sufficiently as it could be, and it isn't a target. I know that when I worked as a parliamentarian on the International Criminal Court, we had um, an organization that I belong to called Parliamentarians for Global Action, where we took it upon ourselves to meet with parliamentarians in other countries to identify what the International Criminal Court was. Because there was a lot of talk about taking away sovereignty, and we said, no, it's strengthening sovereignty. And, uh, we were successful in over 60 countries uh, in playing our part to have the ICC recognized. Um, it again is struggling with the same issues that other international human rights aspects are. But I think there could be a more coordinated approach at parliament, parliamentary level and the government level. I know that um, this government and the previous government have raised the Magnitsky Bill with others informally. Um, and I think uh, I'm not privy to what they do behind closed doors now. So uh, I'm hoping that they are raising wherever possible the Magnitsky type legislation. Uh, what I think was the success of the Canadian one that captured a universal agreement in both houses of parliament was that it wasn't targeted at only one country. It was universal application that we care about the human rights in each and every country. And we don't want to be singling out one country uh, as opposed to another. And so the universality of the uh, Magnitsky bill has um, prompted other people to look at it. Uh, I know that uh, uh, there is some activity in Asia. I know there is activity in Africa to look at it but I would not want to uh, prejudice those countries by uh, some of my confidential conversations with parliamentarians and others Thank for, you for fear that. of um, their lives. Yeah, yeah. I have a question from Ginny Grinevich. It's quite interesting. How could this bill be used to combat sex trafficking? Uh, in her opinion, this is the biggest human rights violation happening right now. 
I agree with her that it is one of the worst forms of human rights abuse, often targeting children, certainly targeting women, but not exclusively. Uh, and it could be used if the perpetrators can be identified and money traced of where it came from. And therefore, it could be a possible use. I think Canada has a history of individuals both in the Foreign Service, uh, NGOs, and just individuals and parliamentarians who see a problem, see the laws we have, see if they can be interpreted to be of use, but also see if there is another way we can do things. We sometimes just go back to what we have. We need to be very swift in that. So I would certainly take up the dialogue on uh, uh, human trafficking because it is, again, I keep using the word complex, it is. And it moves very silently. Uh, but one of the other very good tools on human trafficking is, of course, our criminal system. A question taking a different uh, tack to the, uh, this whole question. Does Canada work with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights under the Organization of American States to further promote the ideas within the Magnitsky Law? I know that the Organization of American States is, fo is focused on South America, is it not, or the, the Americas? It's not. No, Canada, Canada is part. Um, I can probably give you a link later to uh, a study we did again in the Human Rights Committee in the Senate. Um, the Organization of American States is something we have joined, but we have not joined the, uh, the um, uh, court that's related to uh, OAS. And we had a lot of reasons why. Uh, I think we rebutted them and we haven't uh, uh, joined to my knowledge to this point. I don't know if it's in the works or not. Uh, and therefore, I think that uh, we can use OAS as a mechanism into uh, uh, our Latin American colleagues, but OAS is really North America. You know, we're in it, uh, United States is in it, uh, Mexico, of course, is in it, Central America and South America and uh, Caribbean. So we uh, could strengthen our role there and we could certainly highlight this, and this is a, a good suggestion that I hope someone from the government picks up mm. or Parliament. Obviously, there's lots of, uh, of work that still uh, needs to be done. Um, a different kind of question. Magnitsky Law is one thing. How can an individual who is concerned about human rights get involved in some kind of action that, that contributes to the struggle for human rights around the world? So, I mean, I know these organizations like uh, uh, Amnesty International or uh, others. Can you suggest any other uh, venues that people could uh, use to uh, dedicate themselves to this? I think we have so many examples around the world where people have stood up for their rights. And I don't think they thought about a mechanism they saw the injustice and they wanted, whether it was an injustice to themselves or to someone around them, and they've gone about doing whatever they can. Um, I have worked with people in Canada who are very, very committed and who say, let's do something about the injustice. Let's make sure that we do it. And therefore uh, they do whatever they can. Sometimes they join an NGO group and that's where they find out and, and uh, that. But I think that to narrow it down to one way of how someone can contribute, uh, we are very clever as a society. We, we know our rights now more than ever. When I started out in the human rights field, one of the biggest issues internationally was that the United Nations Declaration is printed in uh, six languages. Most of the people who needed knowledge about human rights didn't speak any one of those six languages. And therefore, uh, or were not educated, or were isolated, or were intimidated. They didn't even know the mechanisms for human rights. 
And I think we can, must continue to do that, to point out where the human rights mechanisms are and how they can be utilized. And then individuals, because to me, that's where it starts. They're not rights that you are now going to give me. They're inherent rights that I am born with. That is the Shevchenko <laughs> message that I got, uh, very much so. That it is something bred within us that affects our dignity when we do not, uh, we're not able to have the advantages that an individual should have. I want to ask you about um, opponents of this kind of legislation. I mean, there are people who have uh, interests in not seeing uh, Canada pursue human rights on a, issues on a, on a big scale because it interferes, for instance, with their ability to do business. Uh, I wonder if you comment. I know that just from my own research on uh, the Ukrainian uh, response to the famine, that uh, and 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 st the Stalinist crimes, that uh, there were businesses, for instance, that were importing timber from the Soviet Union that was the product of slave labor, of uh, mm -hmm. exiles and uh, political prisoners uh, uh, treated absolutely abysmally, many of them dying like flies and whatever, and yet. Uh, there were business interests that said that, no, no, that's an that's internal problem. We shouldn't be meddling in their affairs. Uh, isn't this a kind of form of meddling in the affairs of other countries? Uh, that's the argument. You stated the you... opposition. Well, yeah, <laughs> you I know, stated the opposition. <laughs> Quite well. Um, it's not meddling. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility uh, that each and every individual has to others, not just our own citizens. Um, but if you know the Magnitsky bill, it is uh, to uh, attack the issue that was the gap. And the gap was what others, uh, uh, foreign nationals were doing inside Canada. And we didn't want to be enablers within Canada. So it is that, if you want to call it loophole, or that discrepancy that we are attaching. Do not put your money in here if you have taken it by corruption or by violation of human rights elsewhere. You do not bring it on our soil and you are not welcome on our soil. It's a value judgment that Canadians make according to international standards. Now what you're going into is what about Canadians? Which is a totally different issue, which Canada has laws, uh, to uh, attack. We need to do a better job. The uh, anti-corruption uh, legislation is in place. It's being reviewed. Money laundering is being reviewed. Um, corporate social responsibility is an issue in that. And I think uh, it's a dialogue that I've had quite a bit with businesses that go into countries, let's say, that I have worked <laughs> in where um, a, a pervasive corruption is, is often the way you uh, uh, think you have to do business. Uh, I say to them that in the long run, it doesn't work for them. Um, regimes fall. Uh, the uh, ability to work for a Canadian uh, should be controlled, but I think the uh, corporate community by and large needs to dialogue more to see that um, being on the side of the human rights legislation is in their best corporate interests. And many businesses that I have dealt with have responded. They've responded to either closing uh, activity, they've responded by amending their activity and uh, they've set standards where they have walked away from businesses and, and governments, etc. But it is an ongoing struggle. It's to weigh all the foreign policy aspects as well as human rights and to make a value judgment. Uh, there is no situation that to me is sort of uh, so crystal clear. There are some, and those we can attack uh, quite 
quickly, but there are many that uh, we need to work on a multiplicity of ways. And so governments can dialogue, governments can uh, uh, have open dialogue, they can have closed dialogue, they can, but they have to produce results within those structures and reach to ever more unique and innovative ways. And so um, I'm rambling a bit because there's no one answer to that. Uh, but I think that the rebuttal is that in the end, uh, if you want to be a good corporate uh, citizen, you're, and look after your shareholders in the long term, that adhering to human rights standards uh, will pay off for you. And we know how many businesses have been trapped in conflict zones, in upri uh, uprisings. I've done a lot of study on the Arab Spring issues. Um, it is interesting that so many of the trade studies that I was involved with in the Senate we showed the opportunities for trade that we have not taken advantage of. The countries that are opening up and have not taken uh, there. But there was always a conditionality put to it. So long as the government stayed on the track of uh, adhering to uh, democratic type principles, if they were not totally democratic, that uh, so long as the government adhered to international standards, whether they be trade standards or uh, human rights standards, then doing business was a good thing there. So it is a balance and a way. First thing, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, businesses will say, well, if we don't uh, do this contract and agree to pay a bribe and do, you know, engage in these kind of practices, there are other businesses that will take that business from us. And there are countries where these businesses are based and that uh, uh, serve as sort of, we have transiting uh, money uh, laundering operations and other things. Um, but I, obviously it's um, a complicated issue and uh, part of it is to create it in a, as a part of corporate culture, I guess, that uh, the, yes. the corporate culture of Canada and internationally has to be that way. I'm just, I have a question that's sort of more historical, I guess. Um, my vague recollection is, is that the United States had something that was called the Jackson Law or something, uh, Senator Jackson, about a preferred uh, nation's trading status or whatever. Uh, that no longer exists. And that, was tar that was targeting the Soviet Union uh, so that any uh, goods produced by the Soviet Union that were sold into the United States had tariffs I guess that attached to them that made them uh, uh, not very profitable for, for them. Uh, is there not a need for something like that, that a more general thing that if you've got an authoritarian state, a dictatorship, uh, a one party state or whatever that's corrupt and you're dealing, you know, shouldn't there be some sort of punishment saying, okay, this is the way you are, or this is the, you violate human rights or you're a problem, you're not a great uh, member of the international community, uh, so that any goods that you sell to us, you have, will have, there'll be a special tariff slapped onto it uh, as, a, as a form of deterrence and punishment, I guess. Does that make sense? I mean, how do you deal with, you know, known, known dictatorships or, or things? I mean, you've got a country like, I won't, I won't mention any names or whatever, but where uh, a former uh, secret service agent who had a humble income is now a billionaire and, and runs the country perpetually. I mean, how do you deal with that? They're a member I of the international community, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we're now embarking on trade sanctions and trade levers, which is entirely different than the human rights, but um, trade has a, a, a human rights capacity <laughs> uh, to it. Uh, I don't want to comment in the U.S. We're in the middle of an election coming up, so uh, maybe we could have another seminar and webinar on that. But certainly, um, there are levers and there are laws that can be placed um, and need to be placed in our trade negotiations 
and in our um, relationships on the commercial side. Uh, some of these uh, companies are asking for. Uh, we have uh, freezing of assets. We have many uh, levers that we can do. It's a seminar and it's uh, so, but I, uh, the one thing I thought I would go back to and say is, it is not to me a valid argument when a company says to me, well, if we don't do it, someone else in another country will do it. I used to be a judge. You know, just because Johnny did it, you did it. <laughs> it's that kind of reasoning that troubles me a lot. Give me a valid reason. And we do make trade exemptions into countries that we were what? I recall in um, early days in Myanmar, sanctions were put on by the UN, but there were exemption for food products and that we don't put on sanctions without understanding the consequences to the citizens of that country. Uh, and we can go harken back to a, debates about do sanctions work, where do you put them, how do you put them, um, how do you work with them. And there are violators in those and there were penalties for those. So it is a whole different field that um, we could engage in and needs to be. And now with the World Trade Organization virtually out of stall, some people say, some people think it's just a new phase and perhaps a new director coming in. And the last word I heard, maybe two women vying for the position. It may be a new day for um, uh, trade negotiations. Uh, those are the kinds of issues that uh, an international trade regime is. Uh, the world became very connected very quickly. And there is a great dialogue on the place of trade agreements and the revisiting of issues of trade agreements and the levers that go with it. That's actually, this is a, a question that just came in that, uh, from Boris Wachinsky uh, that's somewhat related. As we can see, the sanctions, sanctions can be eased or lifted in relation to some individuals. For example, five years after the change of the political, uh, the change of a political regime in the country um, that, is, that has been accused. Why does this happen if their guilt has already been proven? Why did the sanctions well, for some? Yeah. Um, perhaps I, I should have spent a little more time we have sanctions that were imposed by the United Nations or some other international bodies. And uh, those then can be lifted by another resolution to lift them. So um, the most obvious ones are the ones that came in after 9-11 and uh, naming terrorist activity at that time. So they can be lifted when you believe that the organization doesn't exist anymore or that uh, the government that was trapped with them is now no longer trapped with them. So then you separate the government out from the organization, non-state players. But um, it, then there are sanctions that are state to state. So you're not sanctioning individuals per se, you're sanctioning the state. Um, Tunisia, for example, there were sanctions uh, that uh, I think it was Tunisia, I, I'm having to, all my notes are in Ottawa and I'm in Regina, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, uh, we could lift, once you get a new regime, once you have confidence in the regime that it is the will of the people that have put that regime in and that it's not autocratic or uh, a dictatorship or a military coup, you can lift those sanctions um, and continue. Uh, question is a value judgment. Now, what the Magnitsky bill is against uh, state players who are foreign nationals, but they don't have to be part of the state. You know, a prison warden who uh, doesn't take any personal responsibility uh, can be sanctioned under the Magnitsky bill. Anyone who violates 
because the responsibility is an individual. We all have a responsibility for adhering to human rights principles, uh, for dignity and justice for all. So um, we don't lift those, but there's a mechanism to lift them. But the Canadian government could do more analysis or people can come to them and say, those aren't working right now, lift them. So it is, should be a constant dialogue. Justice is a concept that very much depends on the will of the people. Our time is, is short and uh, are coming to an end here, but I wanted to ask you something a little more personal. You are one of these 13 Canadians who have been uh, sanctioned in retaliation. Uh, how, is, how has that affected you? Have you, have you been received hateful emails? Have you been threatened? Have you, been, have you received any kind of uh, unpleasantry because of, uh, of you, the fact that you're on this list? Um, some of that has happened. I, I, some of it I'm not at liberty to go into. Some of it I don't want to retrace steps. Um, the most, when the sanction was put on, the most amusing which is the lighter side of it, it was that I received many phone calls to say, how do I get on the list? <laughs> <laughs> so um, being on the list to me was not um, the feather that some people thought it was in my cap that I actually had done something in human rights to warrant being singled out. But um, to me, it is a shame that when we work on something like the Magnitsky bill, when we work on the freedom and territorial freedom on Ukraine, that a leader of a country such as Russia would think that I am a threat. I can only ask why. Hmm. I, some and, and maybe to follow it up, I do regret being on that list for one thing. I have a great respect for the history, the culture, and the people in Russia. And uh, it is very difficult to maintain those links with people who seem to be subject to a lot of repression that is unnecessary in my opinion. And I would again appeal to the government to rethink its strategic plan for their own citizens as well as their neighbors and the international community. It is in their best interest to do so. Two quick questions um, of a more technical nature. I think we have time for them. Sure. Um, Elizabeth England wants to know, it appears that the Canadian Business Corporations Act was not amended to reflect the Magnitsky bill, yet some Canadian corporations are known to violate human rights standards abroad, example, gold mining. If the, if the CBCA is not the proper mechanism to keep Canadian corporations in check, what is? All right, that is a developing field, as I said. We're looking at Canadian business abroad. We could pass legislation um, but I think governments in the, well, the 20 some years that I was around are choosing to work with businesses. And this is why we put in some corporate social responsibility mechanisms to work with business. Businesses have put in guidelines. OSC, OSECD has put in guidelines uh, for those members. So there are again, a myriad of levers. Should there be more? Um, one could debate that. Uh, would it make a difference? Um, again, one could debate that. I know that um, Canadians have been very uh, vocal uh, about Canadian businesses abroad. Um, and I think you mentioned before that sometimes when a business leaves, a Canadian business and does not want to do their more nefarious uh, actors come into play. Uh, so there's an upside and a downside uh, of these issues. And I 
I would suggest that we do have some legislation. We do have uh, some uh, guidelines and some other, uh, what shall I call, mechanisms. Uh, where, whether they are enough, I think they're in the process of being discussed. And I go back to um, money laundering, uh, one, because it's the one that's most current and discussed right now. There's also uh, FinTrack, where we trace money. And, uh, you know, we do have Canadians who think there, there is a human rights abuse. The Canadians should not be working there. I'm not one of those. Uh, I want to know whether the government of the day there is responsive to change and to what level are we talking about uh, violations because there isn't a country in the world that at some point isn't violating somebody's rights. Uh, so it has to be um, gross violations, I think. And um, it, I may be out of date, I may not be uh, current in what the thinking should be. And I encourage other participants here today and elsewhere, I continue to say the best ideas how to deal with these issues are to come for the from the future generations because the levers are changing and people's ingenuity should change. We live in a country where our officials and individuals created many of the mechanisms we have today. And we keep going back to them. <laughs> we should be creating new ones. And I hope Magnitsky is one of the new ones. And I trust we will develop more in the coming days. I think that we'll have to uh, wind down on that note. Uh, I just want to personally thank you for your participation in uh, the session today and uh, for being our September lecturer this year. Uh, and um, Steve, uh, Steve Patton, I think, has a, a closing remarks he would like to make as well. Thank you, Yars, and uh, a special thank you to you, uh, Raynell. Um, it was it was a real pleasure. It was it was it was quite gripping, and and these are such important issues. And I believe I speak for everyone who participated, uh, close to 100 people joining in this webinar. When I say we appreciate the informative comments you shared and, and the core message about how the Magnitsky Law is an example of the responsibility of nations, of us collectively, to act on the world stage to protect human rights. I also appreciate the, the amount of time you took for the questions and uh, the discussion, which uh, was very thoughtful and very useful, and I appreciate uh, Yar's uh, facilitating that and speaking for us all. Um, it was a wonderful hour and a bit and uh, much appreciated. And, and I want to thank the Alumni Association for supporting this event and helping to bring us together in this virtual form. And to our guests, I just want to remind you to watch for the post-webinar emails that will include more ways that you can support this program and connect for additional resources and share your feedback as well. So, so thank you, Raynell, thank you, Yars, and thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Dean Patton. The Alumni Association will be hosting a town hall for all alumni on October 20th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. University of Alberta President Flanagan will discuss changes at the university with Alumni Association President Heather Raymond. Alumni will have an opportunity to submit questions when they register for the webinar, and there is a Q&A period during the event with President Flanagan. And we invite you all to visit the alumni website and click on On Demand for a selection of our digital content, including recordings of this and other webinars, podcasts and articles featuring expertise from fellow alumni, faculty and researchers. All digital content is released on our social media channels first, so be sure to follow UAlberta alumni on Facebook and Instagram. That concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us and for supporting your University of Alberta. <laughs>